You know, I was, Pastor Steve asked me to speak, and I was like, man, I kind of, you know, kind of feel like I might have a word, you know. So he said, man, do what you feel God is asking you to do. So kind of want to talk a little bit today. You know, I know you guys have had the theme of, of undefeated. I know a little something about that. <laughs> a little something about that. But, but as I was thinking about that, even though I've been undefeated for a long time as a professional, I've been knocked down. I've had days when I didn't want to do it anymore. I've had days when I questioned how good I really was, if this is something God even wants me to do. And it just dawned on me that, you know, being undefeated doesn't mean that you don't have struggle. It doesn't mean that you don't, you're not going to go through things. Um, it just means that ultimately you are not going to be defeated. So you're going to go through things, but you're going to go through things. And that just spoke to me. And so I want to talk to you guys a little bit today about, about walking in victory. And I want to speak to the believer a little bit, those who have already received the Lord into their heart and just how we enforce the victory God has already given us. I want to speak a little bit to the backslider, the wayward soul, the one who has once tasted and seen that the Lord was good and, and, and they've, they've walked away from the Lord. They've broken fellowship with him. And then I want to speak to the unbeliever, those who have never accepted Jesus Christ into their heart. Maybe they've heard about Jesus and they've never taken that step. Um, I want to speak to you a little bit as well. You guys may be seated. I want to <laughs> you know, I, I think one thing that, that's really important as, as believers, those who have gone through the process with the Lord, wherever the Lord has found you, you have made a conscious effort, a sincere effort to accept the word that you've heard that Jesus Christ has come and died for your sins. You understand how how wretched and sinful you were. I was and and we didn't make any excuses about it. We didn't try to justify it. We just we just received the free gift that Jesus died to give us. We allowed his blood to wash us and cleanse us. We our, our minds are still being renewed. We're still going from glory to glory. And we talked about being champions in worship. I just talked about what it means to be undefeated, at least from my perspective, and then and then walking in victory. And I think it's one thing as believers that we have to understand right away is that we're not fighting for victory. Jesus Christ has already given us the victory through the life that he lived on the earth, through his death, his burial, his resurrection, and then obviously his ascension. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and because of that, we have victory. We're not fighting for it. But what we do have to do is we have to enforce the victory. We have an adversary, the devil, who's a fallen angel. He got lifted up with pride and he wanted God's position. And because of that, he was cast out of heaven. And he is the great adversary to humanity. And we know that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He hates us. He would love us to be separated from God temporarily here on this earth and then ultimately be separated from him for eternity. And knowing that, we should know that he's not going to just make this easy. Now, we know that there are more that are for us than those that are against us. We, we shouldn't fear the devil because we have the God of the universe, our father, our Abba on our side. And his kingdom is greater than the devil's kingdom. We know that. But we still got to roll up our sleeves and fight. God would give, you know, the children of Israel vision and direction on where he wanted them to go. But sometimes they still had to pick up their swords and swing those things. Amen. And. If you look at the book of Luke, and I'm just going to skim through this because I really want to get to the backslider and the unrepentant sinner. But in Luke 4, we see Jesus who had been tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he, he had not eaten anything. And we see the devil come and tempt Jesus with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And I love this because there are times we got to roll up our sleeves and we got to get dirty with the devil and we may have to spend some time by the power of God, by the spirit of God, breaking some strongholds and breaking some things that have been there for a while. But in this instance, Jesus didn't spend a lot of time messing around with the devil. He didn't get into the pig pen with the devil. He quoted three scriptures out of the book of Deuteronomy 
and sent the devil to flight. But I love this because this passage of scripture, this is Jesus understanding who he was, whose he was. He understood his, understood his identity as the savior. He knew he wasn't just roaming about on the earth. He knew he had a purpose. He knew he had a limited time to do what God wanted him to do. He had to finish his course, ultimately die on the cross so we can experience everything we're experiencing today. So the devil comes and he tries to appeal to Jesus um, in his natural body because he hadn't eaten. He, he tempted him uh, with bread. You know, he told him to, 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 to make these stones into bread and Jesus quoted the scripture. He enforced the victory. He, he used the word of God. And again, I'm going to skim through this because I want to get to those, those other two points. But the word of God is one way in how we enforce the victory. The devil's not afraid of us. He's afraid of who's in us. He's afraid of the anointing and the grace that we have on us. But the word of God will make the devil flee every single time. And that's why it's important for us as believers to get into this word so we understand what God has said about us individually God will give us individual words man I want you to do this I'm going to set you apart to do that God will give us corporate words as the body of Christ and then we'll just learn about God's character and his nature and his likes and dislikes and when the devil comes with these types of tactics We'll know how to put him to flight. No, I just read, devil, that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. I know you're trying to make me fearful, but God said that he hasn't given me that. So if God hasn't given me that, this must be you. And you learn how to fight the right way, and you learn how to enforce. That's an inheritance. If God tells me that, that if Jesus said that he's going to give me his peace, I oh mean, I'm going to fight for that thing. doesn't mean we're not going to have times when we have to fight anxiety and fight fear. We're humans. But we know we can come back to the word of God and we can get stable again in our spirits. We can put the devil to flight if we feel like, well, this isn't just some average fear. Like, I feel like I'm getting attacked here. We know we can put him to flight. There's a lot of ifs in this passage here in Luke 4. Where the devil questioned or tried to get Jesus to question who he was by saying, if you are the son of God, do this. And if you are the son of God, do that. And again, Jesus stayed focused and he quoted the scriptures. And ultimately, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. And the devil left. But the account of this story in Matthew is a little bit different than it is in Luke. And when I first read this word, I'm going to tell you in just a second, it blew my mind. Let me see what verse we're at. So I'm going to go to. Luke 4 verse 12 it said and Jesus answered and said to him it has been said you shall not tempt the Lord your God verse 13 now when the devil had ended every temptation he departed from him until an opportune time I never read that before so in other words he's coming back an opportune time a time when he thinks is best. He thought Jesus having fasted for 40 days was an opportune time to tempt him with bread and say, turn these stones into bread. But Jesus was sharp. He used the word of God and, you know, thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word. But that opportune time, it lets us know that seasonally he's going to come back. But when he comes back, we're going to have the same thing waiting on him as we did the last time he showed up. The word of God is not the only thing that we fight with. We fight through prayer. We fight through worship. We fight through praise. We fight with our faith. The Bible says that our faith is what? A shield. When the devil is throwing fiery darts, you're not going to do that. Man, God can't use you to do that. Man, brother, I know you've been clean for a year, but just wait, wait. The right situation, you're going to go back. We lift up our shield, and it's not faith in faith it's faith in the power of God it's faith in the word of God that that if I know that God doesn't want me to be a drug addict if God doesn't want me to be walking around as as as, as a vagabond with you know my roots not settled anywhere and just, just living a life of sin if I know that I can boldly proclaim the word of God and what I know God has said about me and that's going to be a shield. So when the devil's coming, I can stand flat footed. We can stand flat footed as, as believers and enforce the victory God has already given us. It's not God's desire or God's will for any of us. 
to be bound by anything. The only thing that should have control over us is the spirit of God. That's the only thing that should be able to move us like a rudder on a ship. Go this way. Do that. Stay away from that. Talk to this person. Stay away from that brother. Go here. Do this. That's the only thing that should have control over our lives. That's for the believer. The one who has received the free gift. The one who has an inheritance. The one who is in the house of God. And it's our job from day to day to enforce what he's given us. And we'll know what we need to put up with and what we don't based on what's in the word of God. The second person I'd like to speak to is the backslider or the wayward soul. Now, you once had a place in the house of God. You had a seat at the table of God. When you hear things like forgiveness and God's love and the Holy Spirit, you identify with that. You have also, at one point in time in your life, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what it feels like to be showered by his love. You know what it feels like for God to deliver you from things that once had a hold on you. You know what it feels like for God to take the taste of alcohol and lust and cigarettes. Whatever it was that you knew you weren't supposed to be indulging in, that thing or those things that had you, you know what it feels like to be free from that. But somehow, some way, you broke fellowship. That is a form of denial. That's a form of denying him. Turn your Bibles to Luke 15, chapter 11. This is the story of the prodigal son. That word prodigal just means wasteful. Now, many of us, and I know I didn't, many of us didn't have an inheritance that was given to us. Or at least a monetary inheritance. But how many of you know that God has given all of us something? Gifts, talents, anointings, callings. And if we have turned our back on the Lord and we've gone the opposite direction and we are no longer in fellowship, we are no longer in right standing with him, we are wasting the gifts and the inheritances that he's placed on the inside of us. But this story just, this this almost brings me to tears when I read this story because this is such the heart of God. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger son came hastily and foolishly and asked or requested for his inheritance. And I'm sure his father knew that that was not the right thing to do, but his father gave him his inheritance. The son goes off to a faraway land. The distance between the father and the son was not the father's desire. That was the son's decision to live the way he was living and to run off and to really try to shake off the the, the control of his father. The Bible says that through his prodigal or wasteful living, he spent everything. Like I'm sure the father knew he was going to do. Let's pick this up in verse 13. Luke 15 verse 13 the bible says and not many days after the younger son gathered all together journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living or wasteful living but when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want how many of you know that outside of the protection outside of the will of god oftentimes you're going to run into a famine and you're going to be in need or you're going to have some want that's God's love trying to draw you back God's not going to let you God has called you to be in his fold and to to be in his hand and to be in his care and he wants to use you and empower you to do what he's asking you to do you're not going to have no fun in the world I know I didn't I got whooped up quick like it wasn't even fun it was like man I can't be out here just for a little while like I'm trying to be out here. Man, I got hit, hit upside the head quick because God is like, not, not you. I've got something for you to do. Verse 15. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him, the citizen sent him into the fields to feed the swine. Now, mind you, the prodigal had a place in the father's house. He had a seat at the father's table. The father even had 
people that worked under him. And now this young man, through his prodigal living, joined himself to a citizen of the land. And now he's feeding the pigs. Verse 16, and he, the son, would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. Think it not strange if you've turned your back on the Lord and nobody's giving you anything. That's all by design. Those are signs. That's God's love. Closed doors. Brick walls that you're hitting. Getting in trouble. Those are warning signs. Stop, stop, stop. Come back to me. Stop. Because if you had your way out there the way you think you want to have your way, would you ever stop and think about coming home? Let's see what the prodigal did. But when he came to himself... That's it. So he's feeding the swine and the swine was used to the filth, but the filth was shameful to the son. Now he's at a place where he feels now he he's desiring what the swine is eating. We align ourselves with people. We get in situations where they may be comfortable living like that. That may be their role, but it's it's shameful to us. And now what they desire, now we find ourselves because we're out of the will of God. Now we're desiring what they desire. He desired to eat what the swine had. And it said that no one gave him anything. But here's the key. It said when he came to himself or he came to his senses and he said to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? Key point right here. Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. To me, that speaks of humility. That speaks of truth. The Bible says that we will know the truth and the truth will what? It will set us free or make us free. And that speaks of repentance, him changing his mind and going in a different direction. That seems simple enough, but do you know how many prodigals are out there right now that, that, that just won't come to the feet of the Father? They won't come to the altar of God and say, God, I know you already know, but please have mercy on me, for I have sinned. I'm not worthy to be your son, or I'm not worthy to be your daughter. They'll stay out there for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and not recognize that God is drawing them through life's experiences, through the closed doors, through getting in trouble, through the close calls, and they won't do that. And let me say this about truth. God doesn't say you will know the truth and the truth will make him free. He says you will know the truth. We will know the truth and the truth will make you free. That truth is not for God. That's for us. Because when we verbalize and we're honest with God about something he already knows about, that unlocks something in us. We, have a, we get a freedom about ourselves. When we're able to do God knows all things. He's all knowing. So God's not asking us to, to come before him and confess our sin and he be faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness for his sake. He's doing that for us. There is a part that's for him because it's relationship. It's like us having kids. If I know you took the cookie and I test you and I ask you, did you take that cookie? And you're honest with me, that's going to bring us a little bit close. And man, my son didn't lie to me. I appreciate that son. I appreciate that daughter. But if you lie, now we got a whole nother situation going on. Man, why did my son lie to me? That truth is for both parties, but it's really for us. Let's see what the son did. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, God is still looking for some of his prodigals a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Check this out. The father didn't even acknowledge what he said. Verse 22. But the father said to his servant, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf before and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and f and now he is found and they began to be married the father gave him what he didn't deserve 
The father showed him compassion. The father showed him mercy. The father didn't even acknowledge what the son had said. He was just happy and thankful that his son who was lost was found. And the one that he thought was dead is now alive. He placed the best robe on him. He didn't give him something that was second fiddle. He gave him his best. Even though the son didn't give the father his best, the father gave the son his best. He said, bring a ring so I can put it on his finger. Bring sandals so I can put on his feet and get the fatted calf. And if you know anything about that day, that was the best. Get the fatted calf. Not something whose ribs are showing. You don't deserve this, son, but it's available. They got back into fellowship. He came back into the father's house and he once again had a seat at the table. What a blessing. What a blessing. I'm here today before you because of that kind of compassion and that kind of love and that kind of mercy and that kind of grace because I would consider myself a prodigal. I didn't necessarily grow up in a church. I came to Victory Outreach, um, but it wasn't like every Sunday, but I, I, I came and we didn't really grow up in it, but my dad gave me a foundation in the word and he was struggling. He was trying to figure it out. So I knew enough. And then I went astray. I turned my back on the Lord. Just like the unbeliever, the same can be said for the backslider. God is still looking for you afar off. The devil wants you to think that you've done too much. The devil wants you to think that there's no more grace. There's no more mercy. There's no more forgiveness. Well, that is a lie. The father is a liar. And the father of lies. And when he speaks, he speaks his native language. That's his job. We talked about him being our adversary in the beginning. He's supposed to tell you that. So you stay distant from the father and you don't accept what God has to offer. He doesn't want to see your life cleaned up. Because if I can get the dad, then maybe I can get the son. And if I can get the son, then maybe I can get his son. And then I'm trying to destroy this whole generation. I'm not just thinking about you. I want all of you. Because the devil knows if you flip to the book of Revelation, we know how his ending is. And he's trying to take as many people as he can. For the wayward soul, God is still looking afar off. To the unbeliever, that word unbeliever is epitos, if I said that right. That means that's one who is not worthy of confidence. Why, why, why shouldn't you have confidence? Some may say, well, brother, how do you, why, why shouldn't I be confident? Well, you shouldn't be confident because you're not in a right relationship with God. I'll try to do this as succinctly and as, as, as clear as possible, but it all dates back to the fall in the garden. Adam and Eve, whether we realize it or not, those were our first parents. We are descendants of Adam and Eve. God, being perfectly holy and perfectly righteous, gave Adam a commandment on what to touch in the Garden of Eden and what to stay away from. God also formed or took the woman out of the rib of man. That's my rib right there. And in the garden, the serpent or the devil came and whispered to the woman and began to question the commandment that God gave her. Initially, she responded the right way. She repeated what the Lord had told her. But then he questioned God's character. Well, God knows that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will become like him. Well, wait a second. Isn't that how you fail, Satan? See, the devil tells on himself. But he got to the woman and then the woman got to her husband or to Adam. And they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they sinned against a holy, righteous God. And you and I, being descendants of Adam and Eve, we too sinned. Seems unfair, but that's what the Bible says, and I believe it to be true. So God being holy, like really holy, like He's always existed. He never had a beginning, beginning and he will never have an ending. And he, he's, he's holy. He's righteous. He, he formed the world and he created the world. And he also created 
you and I through Adam and Eve, but because our father sinned, those sinned visited the other generations to come. And I won't get into the tabernacle in the Old Testament in the old way that God set things up to make atonement for sin and to have peace with his people. But I will say this. Jesus has always been at the right hand of the father, but he raised his hand and he was willing to come down here on earth and live amongst us. And they recorded a lot of his deeds in this Bible. Jesus dealt with lust. Jesus dealt with fear. Jesus dealt with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the church folk. And he began to differentiate what was religion versus relationship. He was clear about what his father liked and what his father didn't like. We have no excuse because it's in the Bible. But it wasn't just a party because Jesus knew that he had to go suffer the pain of being on the cross. God being holy, blood had to be shed in order for us, in order for atonement to be made for sin, a price had to be paid. Blood had to be shed. Righteous blood. Blood that hadn't sinned. Jesus hadn't done anything to the Father. Our parents, if you will, sinned. And that sin visited all of us. And something had to be done. And again, there was a, there was a temporal or a type and shadow uh, in the Old Testament of how God wanted to do things. But, but God knew that that wasn't sufficient. The law really just showed us how bad we were. Didn't have the power to, to give us the grace to live to God's standard. So God had a better way. He sent Jesus on earth. And Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. And he dealt with and he was tempted at all points. Just like we are. Yet without sin. We can take heart when we read the word. When we go through things. Because Jesus gave us an example. This is not just a book full of rules, y'all. This is there's power in this book. There's power in this book. And the more we get in the word, the more the word gets into us. And the more the word gets into us, the better we can fight. The better we can enforce. The better we can go witness. The better we can go move God's kingdom forward as he gives us, you know, the leading and the guiding. Jesus died. He was buried, he rose, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's offering a free gift to the world. Now, sometimes that will offend people's mind. Well, come on, brother, you're telling me this is the only way to get to God? It's in the Bible. Well, what about the Mormons? Or what about the... I can't speak for that. From what I understand... This is the only God that I know that is still alive and still living and still active in the lives of his people and moving about the earth. And as far as I know, excuse me if, if, I'm, if I'm ignorant and I missed something. But I know for me, I would not be able to, what's the right way to say this? I wouldn't be able, me, Andre Ward, I would not be able to keep a book of rules without the power and the grace of God assisting me to do it. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Jesus, right hand of the Father, he did his part. He is extending salvation. And not just salvation where, okay, you won't go to hell when you die. But he's given us an opportunity to be back in a right relationship with our Father. When you accept Jesus into your heart, when you, when you believe in your heart, and let me say this about believing. You may not understand everything right away. But if you feel God drawing you, if you feel God pulling on you, if you feel something in there, respond to it. Oftentimes, understanding will come later. But the belief will well up in your heart and then it will cause your mouth to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now you align yourself with the Father and the holy God that we've been talking about, when he looks at you, he doesn't see you as a sinner anymore. He sees you through the lens of his son. He sees you through the lens of the blood of Jesus. And now you have been made right. I have been made right 
through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it's not our own righteousness. It's his righteousness that was imputed to us because we were willing to accept him as our Lord and Savior. We were willing to acknowledge that, Lord, I am a sinner. I need help. I don't have the power to clean myself up and then put a suit on and come here and look right. I'm wretched. I'm a sinner. I need help. And just that act alone, a sincere heart of accepting that great gift that was extended to us. Now we align ourselves. Now we are no longer out of fellowship. We are back in fellowship. And here's the beautiful part. The same spirit that was in Jesus Christ now gets in our heart and starts to move about in us. And the standards that he has in here to be faithful to our wives, to walk in love. When God tells us that, that we don't have to be fearful, now we feel like, man, I can enforce that because I, something feels different in me. I can remember when I was, God was really, really dealing with me and, and he was taking the taste of alcohol out of my mouth. See, people don't know that about me. They think it was just, oh, just, oh, he just boxed and he want to go on metal and, ooh, he's on TV. Devil tried to kill me. And he wanted to kill me in my sin. And my mother was an addict. My father was an addict. My mother's drug of choice was crack cocaine. She was out of my life for 20 years. She bounced back here and there, but she was gone. My father did the best he could to raise me as a single father and his drug of choice was heroin hence why he was in the program but thank god that he came to victory outreach god was able to process him deal with him <laughs> deliver him clean him up and get him walking on the right path and then me as i start i'm getting older and i'm starting to understand man what's going on with dad why is he man he's talking about god a lot man he's going to church and i'm seeing him in these shotgun plays and man he's being transformed and man and he's preaching in the home now i'm getting drawn and i'm starting to feel like man maybe god can use me too but the devil he continued to persist so when my father died he had me for a season. I don't know if I was an addict, but I was going strong. I was going strong. I was going strong. And closed doors, getting in trouble, famine in the land, resources being cut off. I'm living amongst the swine and I know that I shouldn't be here and it's comfortable for them and it's their natural habitation and, and, and I'm, I'm getting dirty and I'm, I'm getting, and it wasn't until I came to myself and I didn't know everything that I know about the Bible now, y'all. I just knew I needed God. And I knew everything else would just follow later. I just, I just know if you're telling me that I can come to Jesus I've seen him do it in my dad's life. I've seen him do it in my mom's life periodically. Maybe he can do it for me. And God had to whoop me, but I responded by telling him, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Please cleanse me and wash me from unrighteousness. I need help. He took the taste of alcohol. He took the taste of drugs. He took the taste of <laughs> lust. And it was beautiful because me and my wife, we weren't married at the time, but we had our first child. But we were coming into this new relationship with Christ and, you know, rededicating our life right around the same time. So we were evenly yoked. And I'm just I'm just thankful, y'all. You know, as I was preparing this message and I was telling my wife, I was like, man, sometimes it's hard like explaining the gospel to people who have never heard it because again it kind of offends your mind like well, come on man you mean to tell me that jesus and he died and he, okay yeah but I, what's that got to do with me man i'm struggling i need my bills paid right now i mean i got a drug addiction bro like my kids don't love me no more they don't want to be around me i lost my marriage what does that have to do with me but she always reminds me babe that's not your job is to save people your job is to speak the word just do exactly what God is telling you to do. Say exactly what it says in the Bible. And let the Holy Spirit do his illuminating work. 
So y'all, I just appreciate the time today. And for the believer, be encouraged. Yes, when we gave our life to the Lord, we didn't enlist into a country club. We enlisted into a war. But think about this, though. We were already in a war, but we were just on the wrong side. Now I'm on the right side fighting from a power position, and the commander-in-chief is my daddy. So it's going to be hard sometimes. We're going to have peaks and valleys. But there are more that are for you than those that are against you. Be encouraged. Continue to fight the good fight of faith. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't lose heart. There's a reward at the end of this thing. Be encouraged. God has given all of us something as believers. Continue to enforce it. If you got to tell the devil 15 times a day, devil, I told you. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. I'm not... Man, I resist you. You got to use the word of God like a battering ram. For the wayward soul who has turned his or her back on the Lord for whatever reason, it really doesn't matter. God is still waiting on you. There's still love. There's still a place for you in the house. There's still a seat for you at the table. God still has work for you to do, but you can't waste any time. And for the unbeliever, you may not understand everything up here, but just open up your heart. And I still don't understand everything about that Bible, but I've seen too much to go back, man. The things God delivered me from, the things I've seen him deliver my wife from and people I know from. I was going to shout my brother in the back out real quick. Johnny Vaden, can I shout you out? I'm not gonna give give all the story, but like like even even my brother back here, we we we've been building a relationship. We go to the same church. Um, he did a lot of time, but if you saw him, if he didn't tell you that he did that time, you wouldn't even know he did that time. And the grace I see on this brother's life, and I tease him all the time about the favor he has on his life. I mean, every other day, this brother getting a promotion. Like, bro. He promotions you gonna get man i don't know bro god just made bless me i'm about to go here superintendent isn't like i've seen too much i've seen too much so though the word sometimes may offend your mind just keep your heart open and i would encourage you you tried a lot of things you put your trust in people that you shouldn't have put your trust in people who didn't have your best interest at heart you've gone places you shouldn't have gone you've done we've done all that try jesus just see what happens if there's anybody that let me pray first and then we'll do an altar call father i just thank you for this word today god i just pray encouragement for the believer god the ones who have accepted you and who are walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which they've been called god they depend on you God, they, they live for you. They love you. God, encourage them to continue to fight the good fight of faith. 